Good morning. Will the government of British Columbia toughen up the, law, the laws on dog owners to make it easier for prosecution and conviction when dogs bite people? That's one question in my mind this morning. Does the government plan to start issuing driver's licenses solely through privatized driving training schools where you can go and get your license? Is this more restraint? Three. Are we going to drop our enforcement of Bill C-49 since a small hole has developed constitutionally in the law which was to clear our streets of these pests, the prostitutes and their customers? These are three topics, plus Indian land claims, that I'm going to raise with the Attorney General of the province of British Columbia, Mr. Brian Smith, this morning. And then for variety, we're going to talk to the top professional public servant in Canada the president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada, Iris Craig from Ottawa. That's a different world, but we'll see how things are going there and also across the country. And latterly, for those professionally interested in the hooker problem, we're going to have a word with Tony Serka, who's claiming a partial victory in a case for a client because it would seem that a police car undercover operation is not the proper place in which to attempt to gather evidence to convict prostitution. But first, for the bigger stories, Brian Smith after the break. Brian Smith is the Attorney General of British Columbia, and he knows all about every law in the whole province of British Columbia. And Mr. Smith, I want to put it to you quite bluntly, in view of the recent rash of dogs biting children, why is it that the law requires that the complainant must prove that the dog had a record before he can successfully take action against the dog owner. Is it not time that was brought into the 20th century and the first bite principle removed? First bite for free it, removed. It's, that's a principle of civil law. It's not a principle for prosecuting. You can prosecute uh, uh, an owner of a dog if you can show that they were, that they were negligent. Usually that involves having some knowledge of a dangerous propensity. If you're keeping a dangerous dog and you don't look after that dog and that dog get, gets out and attacks a, a young paper boy, uh, you can be prosecuted under the criminal code for that. But it's an old civil law principle that every dog is entitled to one bite. It's and crazy, it's, and isn't it's, it? And it's only the second bite that makes you liable. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the criminal law and that's not uh, the prosecution policy. It's, it's the case if you're suing an owner civilly for damages arising out of his dog. That's been a, that's But criminal been a, prosecutions for a dog biting someone are few and far between, as one would well imagine. They are because the criminal code doesn't, uh, doesn't precisely uh, differentiate for dogs. It's just the, the general provision of, uh, of criminal negligence that you but have if, to come if, under. If my grandchild is bitten by a dog today, touch wood, I've got to find the information that that dog previously had a known first bite before I can successfully sue. Practically speaking, yeah. And I can't shoot that dog, can I, in a municipality? I can only shoot it in an agricultural area, a non-municipal area under the Livestock Act. Yes, if it's worrying your cattle or your sheep or your domestic livestock, you can shoot it if you catch it in the act of doing that. If you catch it in the act of doing that. Yeah. Otherwise, I believe you have to collar it and hand it over to the local pound keeper who will then take the necessary action. Yes, uh, but if, you, if, a dog, if a dog's attacking your your family or your children, you can obviously shoot it as well. In self so you can't change the civil law in the first bite uh, uh, well, business? Well, I don't think that's where the problem arises. I think the problem arises in, uh, in, in inadequate protection and uh, people apparently harboring uh, vicious dogs and uh, nothing, nothing com has been done about, uh, about dogs that are vicious in some of these cases until they've demonstrated by already biting someone that they're a menace. And well, you I guess we need we need stricter uh, licensing provisions in uh, in municipalities to allow municipalities to control this sort of thing and 
and get rid of get rid of dogs that are dangerous. Maybe you'll instruct the prosecutors to be a bit quicker in laying criminal charges where there has been wanton disregard for the safety of the neighborhood. They will lay the charges if they have the evidence, and uh, maybe in this recent case they will do that. Next point, interesting point. I know that you're, you know, you'd love to privatize everything like uh, Mulroney, wouldn't you? No. Cut down the civil servants, no. lower the taxes, and power the engines of small business. Isn't that the line? They don't always go together, but now, uh, we'd like an, to cut taxes. An incredible thing has happened. A driving school in Victoria, the Safer Way Driving School, is running a pilot project approved by somebody's ministry to issue driver's licenses. We'll conduct the examinations, both written and on the road, then provide a license if the applicant passes. Is this a new trend that you're now developing to make us all go to private driving schools, pay the shot, and then and only then will the license be issued? No, I wouldn't think so. I think it's just a, a, a pilot project uh, which uh, would encourage people to go and have proper driving training rather than trying to put the issuance of licenses under private driving schools. It would be to encourage people who are new drivers to have proper driving training. So if I want to go to that pilot project and pay for my training course in that project, they will then pass me and issue a driver's license to me in the name of the superintendent of motor vehicles. They'll, they would test you, not, uh, not pass you. That's the only problem I can see with it. There would have to be a fair evaluation system and not uh, just a guaranteed pass. You'd have to be a, a, a safe driver when you came out of that. In other words, you wouldn't leave it entirely, hopefully, to the private no. driving school, no matter how good its motives, no. to decide whether or not I'd paid enough in the way of lessons to get a license. That's right. You still have to be able to deliver the, the, the driving Will results. Will you be able to cut down any government jobs because if this pilot project is a success? I don't think it's designed to do that. I think it's designed to try and uh, get better trained dri new drivers on the road, not to try and get rid of... Uh, of clerks who work in the driving branch. I think it's to, to increase the number of safe drivers we have. But the superintendent still retains the right in the final analysis to refuse a license. Absolutely, and he would oversee any testing, and it's, uh, it's not a restraint measure, it's a safety measure. Next question on this benighted subject of C-49. I think it was you that warned and other people did that the law didn't seem to be written very tightly, and only yesterday. While the charge has not been thrown out, a decision has been made by a provincial court judge that a police undercover car is not a public place and the case might fall. No, not quite. He said that uh, the law is too broad and vague in trying to stop prostitution in all places open to public view. And therefore, that part of the law uh, he struck down, but he did say it was a perfectly good law to try and regulate the streets and keep the streets uh, clean. Uh, but in the face of this uh, um, situation in the courts, that means, I presume, that you will now tell all the police forces no longer to use police cars as undercover traps for hookers or the customers, and that you will slacken up on the, pro on, on the prosecution. Not bloody likely. What did you say? Not bloody likely. Oh. We will continue to prosecute, we'll continue to uh, 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 pursue, sue the cases that are before the courts. Uh, it will be, uh, appeal will be taken from this decision, which doesn't set aside the law, but confines the use of it and may interfere with using vehicles. That's right. But we will take an appeal from that and we will carry on our campaign to get prostitution uh, off the streets and out of public view as well. Tolerating it elsewhere, of course. Tolerating, tolerating it uh, if, it isn't, if it isn't a public menace, uh, because there is no way that you can stamp out or ban prostitution completely. And for some law enforcement person to say that would be ridiculous. You can't. More, more with Brian Smith, the Attorney General of British Columbia, after the break. Just in passing to the Attorney General, Brian Smith, I presume that you are quite happy with the Charter of Rights uh, uh, amendments or changes in which the RCMP must not discriminate against the hiring of homosexuals in their force. Does that, do you think that meets with your approval and with the approval of the RCMP in British Columbia? I think there'll be some problems uh, in bringing about any 
any change in that policy, but the uh, Government of Canada has uh, embarked on that and has interpreted the Constitution as providing for it. And that's the way for, it'll be. And that's the way it'll be, so I don't think there's much point in... Uh, in uh, Fighting it. Fighting it. I don't think it can be fought. I think that he probably correctly read the courts, and this is what the courts would do. And as such, it will be followed. That's now, right. I hate to raise the subject of land claims, but your good friend David Crombie, the Minister of Indian Affairs, put the whole weight on your government's shoulders the other day for all Aboriginal claims and says that the federal government does not accept responsibility for compensation and costs involved in settling Indian land claims. Does that statement not put an end to negotiation with the Indian land claimants in British Columbia? I would think that that statement puts an end to everything. It certainly would put an end, I would think, to the, the, uh, the Indians um, campaign for recognition. The federal government uh, appears to be pulling out of the situation completely, abdicating its constitutional responsibilities. I, I don't know of any statement in 115 years of confederation by a federal minister uh, even close to approximating that, saying that uh, the federal government has no responsibility in the in financial responsibility in the field of land claims. I don't understand it, Jack. It is not the Constitution the way it was written. It is not the terms of union under which we entered Canada. Those terms of union clearly say that Canada uh, has the responsibility for the trustee and management of Indians and Indian lands. That responsibility uh, under the Constitution, Section 9124, has been there uh, since the beginning, that Indians and lands reserved for Indians are the responsibility of Ottawa, and there is also the additional responsibility that Canada undertook to pay any debts or liabilities at the time we entered Confederation. Well, if their land claims are valid, if the courts hold they're valid, then it follows that they were claims and debts at the time we entered Confederation. The very first term of the term of union requires Canada to indemnify and pay for those. And you know, those terms of union aren't some kind of scrap of paper. Under the wonderful new Constitution of 1982, they are now entrenched and are part of our law and can only be altered by seven provinces. But apparently Mr. Crombie alters it just with the sweep of his pen. This is in a letter to you. The federal government does not accept responsibility for compensation and costs. What have you or what are you going to tell Crombie, the Minister of Indian Affairs? Well, I'm going to tell him that he's plumb wrong that he doesn't know the constitutional law of the land and I hope that he'll go back and read it and change his mind. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sending a response in the next uh, day or two to him. And I'll, be, and I'll be in Ottawa this week because we have meetings uh, uh, on natives, ministerial meetings, in which he'll be present and uh, I just hope that the letter uh, is some kind of terrible mistake. You're flabbergasted by his I'm attitude. I'm absolutely appalled by it. Well, that puts an end, therefore, to the Haida land claims at the moment, although it might still continue to go through the courts, but even if it comes through the courts, you say, we're not paying, you're paying. Well, it's always been Canada's responsibility, but now he's saying that Canada has no responsibility to pay, that British Columbia uh, now suddenly has the responsibility, that that's a burden of the taxpayers of British Columbia only, and not the taxpayers of the whole of Canada. Your position always has been, yes, you'll negotiate, providing Ottawa picks up the tap. Our position has been that, uh, that there are not Aboriginal claims uh, that are valid and they have all been extinguished. But if we're wrong in that, if the courts say we're wrong, then we will most certainly cooperate and negotiate. But the cost and responsibility will be Ottawa. We'll provide the land if they pay. Well, that's clear enough. Um, now we come to the Jacobson case. You've already had one public hearing uh, on oath of the policeman involved in the Jacobson beating up. Why did you have a second one? Why are you going over the ground again? Well, it's going to be... Surely a... that's a kind of double, double jeopardy no. for these, these uh, policemen, one or two of whom are quite bluntly accused by the mayor and the chief of police of being liars and or perjurers. Well, we had a, a police board inquiry, that's right. And in we, public? Yes, in public. Mind you, it was late at night, on a weeknight, in the police station for three nights, and not many people knew it was on. The press did not cover it very well. So uh, for the press, we're having our first inquiry. 
But this inquiry will be done by the BC Police Commission, which is the superintending body that looks into the conduct of all police. And they will hold a very carefully structured hearing into those questions arising out of the alleged brutality. And they will have, the, they will have counsel. They will have a very senior uh, Crown Counsel who will take over and conduct the inquiry. There will be Instead the of a city hall lawyer who is looking at damages, you're going to have a, a, a Crown Counsel, normally a prosecutor, to well, look at it more coldly, perhaps. It'll be a very senior counsel who, uh, who has done uh, Crown work. I'll be announcing, announcing the details of this probably tomorrow. But a very senior counsel have the right to examine witnesses, and the hearing uh, will, be, will be held just as if it were a judicial hearing. It'll be almost the same as a judicial hearing. A judicial inquiry. And who will act on the recommendations? You? Yes. Yes, I'll act on the recommendations. And the three commissioners will be the judges, and they'll have the same powers as a judge would have in a judicial inquiry. One other question. I understand that a number of big dope dealers in British Columbia are rubbing their hands with joy now since the Supreme Court stuck down that section of the Narcotic Control Act which says quite clearly that if you are in possession of a chunk of drugs, you are ipso facto guilty of trafficking. Now the, now the Crown has to prove not merely the possession but the trafficking. That's going to make it a lot more difficult to lash out heavy sentence the big time coke and dope and heroin dealers, isn't it? Yes, it sure is because the reverse presumption sections of the law were very important in, in drug uh, investigations. It was a way in which you could you could pick up a lot of the, the smaller traffickers along the way and it made it easier to prove it because if they had a, a certain quantity it was presumed they had that to For sell it. That's right. Uh, and the Charter of Rights has struck all those provisions down. I think that's, that's uh, I'm, very, I'm very disappointed. I think that it will affect other law enforcement. It will affect the Customs Act. It will affect uh, drinking and driving. And I wrote to Mr. Crosby right after that decision and urged him to call a meeting of the Attorneys General and to consider uh, repassing that legislation notwithstanding the, char the, uh, the Charter of Rights, that is to override it uh, in the area of fighting drug offenders and in the area of trying to get drinking drivers off the road. I think the public would support overriding the Charter of Rights. And he turned you down on that? No, I haven't heard back from him, but I'm not holding my breath. I'm not very anxious to use that power. The notwithstanding provision of the Charter which enables a province or the country to back out of a specific section. Yes, for criminal law it has to be done by Ottawa. All across the country. Yeah. They would Brian Smith, it. the Attorney General, and your questions to him. Quite a few things this morning. Dogs and uh, driving schools issuing driving licenses and Indian land claims and we might get a couple of happy calls from a couple of big drug dealers after the break. <laughs> Who would be Attorney General of British Columbia? Well, Brian Smith would be. He loves the job. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm your first caller. They didn't mention anything about that. Anyway, I just want to give you a brief scenario of a court case that I went to, and I'd like the Attorney General's opinion. No, I'd... I was uh, given a notice of suspension four days after renewing my license, having lost it. I, my photograph was taken in Vernon. I then uh, transferred to Calgary to work for the same company if, during the suspension. No, no, no. Hold on. Find out what he wants. I'm not going through all day on that call. Go ahead, please. Um, Attorney General, we had some uh, in the school system, some uh, perverts that were allowed to float around on there. They did an immense number, uh, uh, amount of damage to the kids and teachers and everything else. We have the same thing on the police force. We have some very difficult people floating around and they're protected by, uh, you know, the system. When are you going to do something about this? Let me be even more specific than that. Uh, we're talking about one or two specific cases when it's quite obvious that a fair number of public officials did not exert their authority or do their, what we regard as a bounden duty to get them out of the system. What can you do to toughen that up? On the police case, you're holding a new inquiry, virtually a judicial inquiry. But what about the problem of the pedophile in the school system? It's a very serious uh, problem. It's, uh, I think, uh, something that uh, has absolutely rocked. Uh, the education community that uh, this sort of thing isn't just isolated, that there are a number of cases 
that have come to light where people who were in trusted positions with young people were abusing them sexually. Uh, it has got to be uh, rooted out of the, of the education system. I think it's the Family and Children's Act which gives protection to any person who makes a complaint without malice and must be, uh, that must be, that wasn't done in this case. No, it was not done and uh, people turned a blind eye or I guess didn't believe what they saw and now that it's come to light, uh, I think a lot of people are ashamed. We have to root this out of the school system. We have a case now before the courts. As soon as that case is finished, Jack, uh, the Minister of Education and I will be announcing a, an initiative which uh, we hope will have the cooperation of the teaching profession. Psychological examination of teachers? No, no, nothing like that. Nothing, not a broad blanket? Nothing like that. No, something, uh, something that uh, will be targeted and something that will work. Go ahead, please. Uh, good morning. I'm glad I got through there. Uh, I'm sort of appalled at the, the way that the minister would sit there and, and say that he feels it would be more productive to have people assumed guilty until proven innocent. It just goes to show his mentality in relation to the freedom in this country. And I wish he'd quit using drug users as scapegoats because booze and, uh, booze and tobacco are the worst drugs in this society. And don't tell me we don't need any more. We all know we don't need any more. But the criminal sanctions not the way to deal with drug abuse or drug use. Fair enough. He wants you to legalize the use of drugs and to not insist on the reverse on us. Well, the object is to is to get drug the sale of drugs uh, out of business, not to uh, not to try and crack down on a lot of small drug users. It's uh, it's to put away trafficking in drugs, and those sections of the Narcotic Control Act that reversed the onus did not take away someone's right to be presumed uh, innocent. It simply made inferences based on a finding of a lot of drugs that that guy just didn't have them for his own use, that he didn't have a thousand baggies of marijuana in his suitcase because he wanted to have one every three hours. He had them because he wanted to sell them, sell them to kids in school grounds and other places like that. And you need those tools in the law, Jack, to put those people out of business. Go ahead, please. Yeah, that's me? Yep. Yeah, I'd like to know what the sitters the wild dog around and he bites little kids, he don't, you know, this dog, he hates kids, eh? What do a person do about that? What does who do about it? First you look after your kids, two you warn your neighbors, three you report it once to the police if it happens, right? That's right. It's all you can do because, it, it's, we, you know, everybody loves dogs. Almost everybody. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. I'd just like to say that I think it's just a shame that uh, elected officials uh, undermine what uh, little laws we have as far as that drug uh, striking down thing goes. Uh, it, it's just ridiculous uh, to take something like that, uh, a teeth out of the law like that, and uh, I think we should just run them out of the polls next time if they can't come up with uh, the... He's blaming you for what Crosby did. No, I don't think he, he... I think his instinct is right. I just don't think he understands what happened. It isn't elected officials that are doing that. It's the courts under the Charter of Rights who are saying that those reverse onus provisions can't be used anymore by the police. And I have said to Mr. Crosby, the federal justice minister, I think you should pass the law notwithstanding the Charter of Rights. And uh, I, maybe he will. I doubt it though, don't you? Well, they never have been very interested in doing that. Go ahead from Mission. Yes, I'm a block cutter, a shake block cutter from the West Coast. And we have the police coming out into the bush and checking out our equipment. I just wonder if that's standard practice for other professions and trades. Why would the police come out into the bush on the west coast to check a shake block cutter? Why? Where is he? Is he hung up? Yes. No, uh, why? They, they, they come and check their serial numbers on our saws and things to see if oh, they're not stolen. Oh, I see. Well, they must be on just checking to see if they're stolen. Yeah. They certainly wouldn't be around to make safety checks, I wouldn't think. I no. no. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Smith, uh, if the, with the driver's examiners, if they do intend to actually do away with the driver's examiners. I didn't really answer that before. No, no, no. I don't, there's no, going to be no doing away with driver's examiners, as I understand it. 
We're in the just, provincial government, I mean. In, no, in the provincial government. We still have examiners, and most people will just go and take an exam. But uh, we want to encourage more drivers training. So to do that, we have a pilot project which will allow the company that trains you also to test you. And to try that out. And, and issue the license. Issue the license. That's right. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Mind you, you were the government that took away the best thing we ever had in the highway, aren't you, Mr. Smith? Well, that's the a, testing of the motor vehicle. Well, that's a matter of opinion. They weren't fairly tested around the province, only in two parts of the province. Go ahead, please. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I was wanting to ask Mr. Smith exactly how long it takes normally to receive a, a letter back from uh, his office. Well, Put down the, your television set, you s silly person. Okay. <laughs> I almost said silly woman. I don't know. I take it from your question that it's taking you too long. Maybe, maybe you, uh, maybe you'd like to leave your name at the switchboard, and uh, we can look into your particular complaint. Sometimes these letters do take too long. They have to go through various officials and get rewritten, and uh, I, I get appalled sometimes that it takes so long. Okay, it's been over a month, and it was sent to you by a lawyer, and we thought maybe we should have some kind of re reply by now. Would you just, that, that is not abnormal, unfortunately. Would you leave your name at the switchboard, and we'll get back to you? Okay, hold on. Thanks. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Uh, Mr. Smith, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, sir. The question is this. If you are pulled over by the RCMP, and you pull off of Crown property into a private plaza, mm -hmm. and you are asked to get out of your vehicle, and you don't get out of your vehicle, and the RCMP take a, a, a tire iron and smash your window out, is this legal? It's not too desirable. Let me put it that way, it's probably... Uh, well, you must give us a step for a hint. To, 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 all right, the hint is this. I was pulled over by the RCMP on King George Highway. I pulled off of the highway into a plaza. And what? I was under of the uh, understanding that a car is your private property. The officer asked me to get out of the vehicle. I said, no, I will not get out of the vehicle. It is my own private property. He said, I am putting you under arrest. Either you get out of this vehicle or I am going to get into the vehicle. At which point he went over to his cruiser, took out a wheel wrench out of the trunk, came over and gave me one last warning. I didn't heed the warning. He went around to the passenger side of the car, smashed the window out, cutting himself. The glass cut my head and my leg. I want to know, my question is this, is when I am on private property. I've got your question. Let me ask you a question. Were you charged? Yes, sir. What were you charged with? I was taken out of the vehicle and charged with impaired driving. Were you impaired? No, sir. Did you take a breathalyzer? No, sir. Did you beat the charge? No, sir. What do you mean you didn't? Have you been up in court yet? I have been in court. What happened in court? Kangaroo. Just a minute. Did the judge find you guilty? <laughs> yes, sir. You answer it, Mr. Attorney General. He seems to have a hang-up about the private property. If he was act, drunk and the policeman wanted to make him out of the no, Makes no difference whether he was on private property, whether he owned it, whether it was subject to an Indian land claim or whatever it was. If he was drinking on it, he's contravened the criminal code and the police can make requests and can take reasonable steps to apprehend him and get him out of his car. Whether that's a reasonable step in the face of things would would not be for me to to observe except that he did not blow in, a, in the breathalyzer which i think is unfortunate if he was innocent uh, more with attorney general brian smith after the break <laughs> If that guy hadn't said his conviction was a kangaroo court, I might have got a little more excited about it. But who knows? You were very calm. I always am, sir. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I have two dogs, and I rotate them on the chain on a daily basis in a large front yard. Now, my question is about beware of dog signs. If I put up a sign that says beware of dog, am I admitting that my dogs are dangerous if they do bite someone? And if I don't put up the sign, Am I lacking in that? Like, what, how, what's the best way to cover myself in the event that they do bite someone that comes on the property within their length on the chain? Uh, this, I think the sign does help. 
Uh, it doesn't help with a small child who, who doesn't read, but uh, the, the same token, uh, if you have your property fenced or have some reasonable fencing and you warn people that you have, you have dogs there and if they're on a leash, then you've pretty well done all that's reasonable, and if uh, I do keep them on a chain, though, if I put yeah. up some kind of a barrier that would prevent people from going, from walking on the property, like the mailman. Everyone knows the dogs; yes. they bark a lot, but they haven't bitten anyone because they've never put in that situation. I think adverti advertising them does help you. I don't think it. Uh, it would, I wouldn't be admitting in court that I knew no. in advance that they no. were dangerous or anything. No. If the dog got out and over the fence and attacked the toddler, he'd still be in deep trouble. Right. We're all in deep trouble when, we, when, when a toddler's attacked. Thank because you. toddlers can't be contributorily negligent. Go ahead, please. Hi, yes, Mr. Smith. I was uh, involved with a high-speed car chase at the age of 13. I was uh, attacked by police. When I was caught, I was chased by police when I was caught, and a dog was sicked on me while a police officer was holding me and biting me. I have the scars to prove it. I was ripped, my leg was ripped apart. At that time, uh, I was being held in adult custody because I was being, I could not be held in a juvenile containment because I was being sexually molested by people there involved in the containment program or in the juvenile detention homes. And I was raped there twice. And then I was held in adult custody at uh, 312 Main Street. I was molested by two transvestites and I was raped, I was raised out of court at 14, only for the being in possession of, uh, uh, of uh, a theft under, a theft over. Understood. And I was raped, I was put into a cell with uh, BC Penn inmates. Hold a second. Raped. And I have, the, I have the emotional scars and the physical scars in my butt to prove that. And I want to know what the hell can I do about it. First of all, let me ask you a question. When did this happen? This happened uh, when, uh, back in 73 and 74 and 75. Well, that's 15. That's 11 years ago, right? Uh, believe me, I've been trying my damnedest. I have letters that my mother has been written and uh, writing left and right to get that done, and it has been covered up by police left and right. Well, I don't know if it's been covered up by police, but I'll look at your correspondence and send it on to the Attorney General if it smells. Pardon me? I'll look at your letters and send it on to the Attorney General and do something about it if it smells, but often you get these cases that are so old it's not capable of putting any proof to the thing. You send me the stuff. Okay, well, uh, just hold on. That's no, concept. hold on. I can't go through that forever this morning because that's 12, 11, 12, and 13 years ago. I know these things have happened, and so does the Attorney General. Okay, now that, that cop that... Uh, hold on. I'm not going to talk about the cop at the moment. Take his number on three. It's one of these tragic stories that's been bubbling up inside him for all the years, and how much of it is true or not true, I don't know. Go ahead from Terrace, B.C. Yes. Uh, I'm calling, uh, uh, this, this is a, a two-fold question. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, is not uh, the provincial government uh, set up there so that they can take uh, care of the, of the local affairs, that means the provincial affairs of the people? Yes. Okay, now then uh, the second part of this question is, now why is it put on to the soldiers of the, the soldiers of the, of the federal government, if you were put here to take Hold on. He's asking you quite simply, how it is that we have to be Ottawa's laws and the reverse on us, etc.? Because the criminal code is federal. Because we have a, a constitution that has a divided system where uh, the federal government has some lawmaking authority and the province has some lawmaking authority and it's, uh, it's shared and we have to obey the laws of both parts. It's complicated, but it seems to work. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Mr. Smith and Mr. Webster. Good morning. Uh, you made a statement, Mr. Smith, about dangerous dogs. Now, what kind of dogs do you think are dangerous? That's one question. And you made another statement that putting up a sign of beware of dogs would help. That's, uh, if you put that sign up, you're telling people, the Canadian Kennel Club will tell you that if you put that sign up, you're telling people that you do have a vicious dog, and you're warning the people that you have 
uh, a vicious dog. So uh, you shouldn't put up that sign. Oh, she means you should keep it secret from people that you've got a vicious dog on a no, chain. No, 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 I'm not saying that, Mr. Webster. Sounds like that to me. No, I'm not saying that at all. If you had a dangerous dog, I don't think anybody's going to keep a dog that is dangerous. If you put up a signed guard dog on duty, you're telling them that you got a dangerous dog. But a beware of dog sign, you shouldn't put that up. Well, that's well, not your that, advice, is that, it? Well, it may be uh, the advice of the Kennel Club, but I'll tell you, uh, I've been a paper boy, and I've peddled my, my little uh, legs around Oak Bay as a youngster carrying Vancouver Province newspapers. And, when uh, it was a good newspaper. When it, when it was a newspaper. <laughs> and uh, I uh, can remember uh, encounters with dogs, and I, can, I know how terrifying it is. And, uh, well, we all love dogs, and we all love our own dogs, and we don't think that we, any of us have a vicious dog. Uh, there have been too many of these incidents, too many, too many youngsters attacked by dogs. Yeah, here, yeah. go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? That's you. Me? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to relate an incident uh, to my attorney general. Uh, I was going to Terrace, I had a job confirmation, I was in Prince George, and I had a two-hour delay for the bus. So I decided to go out and I put my back up against the tree and I was resting and I dozed off. All of a sudden, bang, in the ribs I had a boot. And I opened my, open, and my eyes and there was two police officers. They asked me my name, I gave my name, they took me to the drunk tank. When I, and I wasn't drunk. I come up in front of the duty sergeant and I said, I, I just opened my mouth to explain that I was going to terrorist for a job and I got the choke hold. I urinated in my pants, I defecated in my pants, and they threw me in the, in the tank. Well, <coughs> Mr. Attorney General, do you think that we should uh, do something about the chokehold? It's banned in several states, uh, uh, down in California for one, Texas. When did this happen? Oh, last year. It was did, summertime. Did you make a complaint about it? To who? Well, you could have come down and made the complaint to the B.C. Police Commission. Oh, to the police, B.C. Police Commission? Yeah. Well, I guess that would have been the proper procedure. Superintendent of the RCMP, the oh, attorney. My my personal my personal feelings still really don't matter. It's it's do you do you feel that the, that chokehold that's that and I still have damage in my throat from it. Do you think that that chokehold should be banned? Yes or no? I don't think it's uh, it's something that's that's used very often. Uh, it's used. It may be used, yeah. Used with druggies with a balloon in their mouth. Yeah. I'm not a druggie. I don't no. know. I'm a university no. graduate. I was no. on my way to a job. No. Why didn't you follow through with your complaint then? I tried to, I tried to talk to the sergeant behind the desk. Well. And bang, right from behind me. Just, just a uh, neck crushing blow. Are you gonna go and I study nine kondo and kendo and keto. I don't use it. Why should the police use it? That's a tough one. Attorney General. Self. My Attorney General. Yeah, well, self, self-defense would be one case where they might use it. Self-defense? I was facing the sergeant, and he jumped me from behind. I was just trying yeah. to explain. Well, I wish that you had, uh, you had done something to follow that up uh, right afterwards at the time, because we're not going to improve uh, you see, policing, you see, and we're not going to... It doesn't matter too much to me, because I... I've learned to cope with the, the 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 way the waves go, but the young the young kids who get the, that have this happen to them. Okay, well just get meaner and meaner. Fair enough. It's something that you've got to keep a close eye nowadays on. Police are much better than they used to be in the yeah. old days, but sometimes one thinks, uh uh, that should have been investigated. But you can't investigate it unless somebody. Gives it to you. No, this guy wasn't a complainer, though. He obviously uh, didn't feel he wanted to make a big deal of it, but he expressed his view here. It would be helpful if, he, at the time, somebody like that would come forward to the RCMP. He may have a point, that. though. He, he may, may have, have a, a good point, point. That the chokehold should not be used by police officers. That's right. Except in the direst, the most stringent emergency. My thanks to the Attorney General, Brian Smith. Thank How's you, How's it going over there? Oh, Victoria. Qu quiet. Uh, Quiet. No election this drowsy. Uh, what do you think? Boring. 
no, no, no fire in the opposition benches at all. Most of them are Not all retiring. Not much fire in the government either, is it? Always that? a lot more fire. A lot more fire. Now, did you hear McGeer's, uh, hear McGeer's speech last week? No, I didn't hear oh, McGeer's it was speech. A, it was a barn burner. Was that his bunkum speech that he gives <laughs> to me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was his bunkum speech. <laughs> My thanks to I must come over and see if you're all sleeping up the switch. No, you should come over and liven us up a bit. Somebody's got to. <laughs> My thanks to Brian Smith, the Attorney General. Next, to the people at the top of the, the um, ladder in the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada, our dedicated professional public servants after the break. Iris Craig. <laughs> Well, the thing to be in Canada nowadays is to try and get yourself a nice cushy public service job because you've got security for a start, you see, and you've got an index pension for a second. You've got very good health and dental, dental benefits. Said he, putting that provocatively to Iris Craig, the new president of, the, of PIPS, the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. Good morning. Good morning, Iris. That's the best kind of job to have nowadays, isn't it? A nice, secure federal civil service I job. I don't agree with you. It's not secure. I thought you were all secure, you people. No, we are not secure. Especially those of you higher up the ladders. Well, I don't know how high up you're going, but <laughs> even at the even at the very top, they're out for election, so I don't know. Is right. anybody secure? Your 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 body actually is. Who who's encompassed by your professional institute? Twenty thousand uh, professionals that represent the medical and the lawyers and the research scientists. The, the historical research people, the biologists, all the professionals. Yeah, you're the people, for instance, who would advise uh, on the content of tuna cans and whatnot. That's right, that's right. Uh, now, are you a union as such? Yes. And I understand you've just recently signed a good new contract. Well, I don't know what you called a good new contract. We fought hard for our rights and we signed a contract, yes. How much did you get in the way of an increase? Well, first year we got 3.7. Percent, yes. And the second year? <laughs> 3.5, yes. 3.2 2 the second year. And the, is it a third year to the contract? Yes, and it's less again. It's less again. Yeah. But that means you're going to get 9% at least over the next three years. Well, that's over three years. Yeah. Now, what are your problems with this Mulroney government? What don't you like about uh, this Mulroney government, the way they handle your people? Well, we don't like their uh, indecision, and they keep saying they're going to cut everything, they're going to privatize everything, they're going to contract out everything, but they never come forward and say exactly what they're going to do. That's what bothers us. It makes us apprehensive. Now, when they sold off some of these crown corporations, did that include your members? No. 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 You're all federal civil servants as such. Yes. Um, I presume that... You're worried about what this horrible word downsizing. That's How many of these of your people are being cut under the Moroni budget plans? Well, they're working on it now. We don't know exactly. They have promised there'd only be 5,000 in this round, which covers everybody. But we don't know exactly how many will be. That, of course, creates even more apprehension because they keep talking about programs that they're going to contract out or going to privatize. And they don't tell us exactly who's involved when that happens. And that's what creates the anxiety. And they haven't given you any deadline. The Nielsen Task Force materials will... It hang just on. came in. Just came in now? Yes. Have you looked at it to see if any of your people are going to be severely yes, affected? Yes, if they do some of those things that are suggested in the Nielsen Task Force, I can't see how our members won't be affected. They will be affected. Mm -hmm. um, mandatory retirement. Don't you think it's shameful? that it looks like people don't have to retire at 65? I think if a person at 65 feels they have something to contribute, they should be allowed to carry on. And I, if we're depending on those people to keep everybody else employed, only a few will stay, they will stay on. If, if we're expecting that to help the unemployment, then I think we should forget it because there's not that many involved. No, no I think it's a help. I mean, throughout the whole, especially with, with the fact that you people are reasonably secure at certain status. Reasonably, we're not secure. After even five or seven years in, you're secure. Oh, that's not true. They're, they are giving pink slips to people who have been 20 years in the service. That's where they're wiping out a whole department, I presume. Well, they're wiping out a program or a department, and they're not secure at any time. That People get that, and that's a fallacy. 
Well, you, you can't convince me of that because everybody who retires from a, a pensionable job with a full pension should go and make room for somebody else at the bottom, surely to goodness. Well, they may go, and a lot of them do go. But maybe their pension's not that good. Maybe they have had problems through their life. Why should they go if they can contribute still? Mm -hmm. And it's not going to make room for all these people who are unemployed. Listen, one little thing you might be able to tell me about. What's the score on airline credits? You know, these aeroplan things and whatnot. We are well, supposed to turn all those back in. They we're not allowed to use them. And if people have used them, they've abused the system. If they have used them. And I'm sure people abuse them. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm a federal civil servant. I'm flying back and forward to Ottawa and I build up my credits. And apparently it's possible, if you're crafty, to take that for a private holiday trip, your credits. Well, you're not allowed to. By rule, you're not allowed to. <clears throat> you're abusing the, your privilege if you are. No, you're you're supposed got to, to turn back when you turn in to your... To use for the next lot of government travel. That's right. Well, what do you see ahead for your PIPs people? Do you uh, anticipate a real rough, tough time with this it government? It is rough, tough times right now. I, yes, I expect a rough, tough time. That's what it is. The times are tough. This government is going to cut the deficit regardless is what it says, regardless of our culture or heritage, regardless of the work we have been doing. Of course it's rough, tough times. Well, they can't do anything and else. You don't help it by saying that we're all sitting there in secure jobs. When we go to Toronto or Ottawa, we're in a different world of prosperity and affluence and all the rest of it. That's not true. You say that. Six percent unemployment in Toronto, eight mm percent -hmm. in Ontario. God knows how little there is in Ottawa. Ottawa has a high unemployment rate, too. I can't remember the exact figures, but it's not good either. So it's people like me who snipe at civil servants and politicians who are evil. No, I didn't say you're evil. I just said you don't help the situation. Snipe at the government. Tell them that they should get busy and do the sorts we of things. We snipe at the government all the time. <laughs> but it's 3,000 miles from here to Ottawa and 30,000 miles from Ottawa to here. <laughs> We're very parochial. Are you? <laughs> Have a, look, you might get a rise out of Iris if you give her a bad time. See if we can get some phone calls to Iris Craig of Pips. First woman president of Pips <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Go ahead to Iris Craig of the biologist to trade. That's right. Of PIPS. Uh, as a retired civil servant, um, I would like to know if there's any recent information on the indexing of pensions. Mr. Mulroney said he was going to do away with those. And those are pensions that we paid for for many years that we were working. That's right. And we don't believe that, uh, that uh, you paid for this. You sure are entitled to have it. And is there any recent news? No, they're, uh, they're, you're getting it as far as I understand. Uh, the lobby worked. But the more recent information was that they were going to invest our money wherever they want to invest it, at whatever low interest they want to invest it, and we would only get the income from the interest. No, I think you're going to get the indexing. I hope you are, and that's what we're fighting for. Well, keep working on it, will We you? are, we are. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to hear about the uh, dental plan you mentioned in the introduction, if it's finally come through for the civil servants. We're working on it. They vote, the board of directors is voting on it next week. We've been discussing it, and uh, we've been looking at it. You don't have it? one? No, we don't have one. No. You mean your particular PIPS doesn't have one? No, our members don't, do, not, do not have one. Oh, the provincial government has a wonderful one. And do so they? do all the cabinet ministers and the premier and all the rest of it. Well, the federal civil servants don't have one, and the one we've been offered we feel is a little expensive, a little rich for what... And you're still fighting it? We're fighting it. We'd like to improve it. Thank you, sir, and thanks for bringing me up today. I presume that you would have that along with all your other benefits. Yeah, I'm sure you would. <laughs> uh, go ahead, please. Well, the only thing that the public servants have got is, is burgeoning bureaucracy in their professional institutes and their various unions, which we're required to join and we have to pay for. A few years ago, it was $80 a year. I think now I see on my husband's paycheck, it's almost $300. they are useless anyway because they, they never get anything from the government. The government go, always goes to arbitration. The government gives you what they intended to give you all along, if it's anything. I, I don't I don't accept that premise at all. I, well, I haven't got a dental plan, which is what well, everybody we're working wanted on it. and we're, everybody asked for in that questionnaire. 
And uh, so Where what do you working? do? You turn around and you say, well, the dental plan's too expensive. Well, it's not as expensive as me having to pay thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars to my dentist for all the on the whole the dental plan that has been offered is expensive if you look at it across the country yeah. and i don't accept your premise that the uh, union has not helped i don't know where we would have been if uh, the union had not pushed the government for our contracts i suggest to you we would have been in a very poor shape but she says that you have a budgeting bureaucracy in fifths. I don't accept that either. We don't have that, I think. Well, that Jack, maybe I'll put together the, the piles of paper. Well, that do we that and send and it. Forth from Ottawa. And send it to me. I've never seen so much garbage and crap, and it's usually about hiring new people to work in the professional institute. Thanks, my dear. You say that's stuff. not true. Not true, no. You're causing more trouble than I anticipated. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. I would like to know, uh, uh, your guest to give an answer on this indexing. You seem to have a hang-up on indexing for civil servants. I don't have any hang-up. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about Mr. Webster. Oh, he has. That's for sure. But we pay 1% for our indexing of our pensions. That's right. We pay for them. Yes, we pay for the indexing. That's right. That's why I'd like you to verify, because every time a civil servant gets on his show, he keeps bringing up this indexing of pensions. It's the MP's pensions I hate most of all. That's I'm good. not talking about that. You talk about civil servants, and I was a civil servant, and I paid for my indexing, which That's... I'm entitled to. That's right. You're right. Thank you, sir. Sorry about that. Maybe I'll back off. Go ahead, please. Not Never back off. Go ahead, please. Is that me? That's you. Yeah. I would want to know why that gal has to have security on her job when I didn't never had security in all my whole life. On I don't job. know who's uh, who you're talking about that has security on their job. Tell me who. Well, I said that by and large, after good service, well, you have you're security. Well, you're crazy. You're crazy. I'm not crazy at all. They Once don't have security. I told you there's many members that have 20 years in the service who have been given pink slips. Go ahead for Victoria. Good morning. Morning. Mr. Webster. Yes. I'd like to ask your guest. I retired when I was 64 from 30 years of service with the, the, the Department of National Defense. When I retired and I got my pension, when I become 65, I lost $176 off of my government pension. When you got your old age pension? Old age pension. I want to ask uh, the, your guest, how come they, they, I paid to it, now I lose it? How come? I don't understand the question. Yeah, the Meldy did at 65 and some pensions, yeah. isn't it? CPP. CPP. Yeah. CPP is melded in. Yeah. And that's part of the scheme, I yeah. suppose. I don't know what the reason is, but it's a government decision. Last call. Go ahead, please. Oh, Mr. Webster, yeah. I have to agree with Iris as a past government employee for 30-some years. Uh, the security of always having a government uh, job after so many years of service was lost when they, uh, the Trudeau regime, they put us on unemployment insurance. And I think that after that, time, you really didn't have any security in a government job. Thank you, ma'am. Well, this is your first trip across the West, is it? Yes. A two-year time? As a union, but I've been out here before. <laughs> well, best of luck anyway. Thank in you dealing very much. with this highly unsatisfactory Moroni government. That's right. Thank My you. My thanks to, to Iris Craig of Pips. Yeah. Next, we're going to chat up John Fryer, who's been in the bucket in Newfoundland this morning, briefly, and uh, Tony Serka on the prostitute problem after the break. It is with some hesitation and trepidation that I'm going to spend a segment or so to try and explain what's happening to this benighted hooker law. When Bill C-49 came in, there were warnings from people like Tony Serka that it looked like it was full of holes. Now, Mr. Serka has just obtained a decision on a pre-trial issue from a magistrate which shoots a couple of big holes in it. But first of all, let me ask you, Mr. Sarka, has your client yet been tried on this particular soliciting offence? No, this was a uh, pre-trial motion. It was a, um, a constitutional uh, submission to say that the, uh, the entire legislation was uh, vague for uncertainty. And what did the judge decide yesterday, the provincial court judge, Mr. Libby? Well, um, uh, Judge Libby decided that um, uh, whilst most of the uh, section is not vague, he ruled that um, two parts of it, in any place open to public view and the definition of public place, 
um, went too far from the purpose. The purpose of the legislation was to combat street solicitation. The effects of it are different. They practically stop all, all sorts of prostitution. Prostitution in, in um, uh, cars, prostitution in uh, West End apartments because it's in public view. So he excised that part. It's difficult to understand. Okay. I know that you were complaining earlier on about the use of the phrase to communicate with any person. Yes. But in, in the opener says every person who in a public place or in any place open to public view. And mm -hmm. then it brings in all the things about the traffic and the yes. communication for the purpose of engaging pr prostitution. Yes. How can that mean in an apartment, Tony? Oh, it, uh, in any place open to public view. That means that the, uh, it can be a private place that the public can see into. So or that could be an into. apartment or go into. Or like like a, tele a telephone booth. Uh, well, although the public have access to that, but a private place. A private place can become a public place under certain circumstances. Like going into a bar. Right. No, but a bar is a public place. Because, right. the, because the public have, a, uh, have access to it. So it's a nice definition of in any place open to public view. Right. But if you take that out, what you have left is public place. And since you don't have a definition anymore, you go back to Deborah Hutt. And Deborah Hutt said, amongst other things, and it was a chief uh, justice who uh, agreed with this decision, that a police officer's motor vehicle is not a public place, but it's a private place. So therefore, when we come to public place, we then come to the tactics used by Vancouver City Police in putting undercover operators in a, an unmarked police car. Right. As you know, just about all the prosecutions are done by undercover policemen. Uh, and how they do it is they uh, drive up in a car and they inveigle the, uh, uh, the prostitute to get inside the car and then they talk about the deal and that's it. If, it. if it's only communicate, that's it. That's all they need. Yeah, I know, but the fact is that that previous public place or that police car is now a private place. Well, it's now a private place according to Judge Libby, but another provincial court judge could say, well, I don't agree with Judge Libby. Uh, he might agree with my entire argument, or he might reject my entire argument. It's very difficult for the ordinary person to understand. I mean, I can understand what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. But on a common sense reading, which is, I presume, what Crosby yes. did, it makes sense to me. In any place open to public view, that's like in a lane or an alley or a parking lot. Th that may be what he meant, but we, uh, a penal statute has, it can't be vague. You have to, uh, first of all, look, look upon it as to the plain English meaning of the words. And that's uh, because uh, a citizen must know if, what, if the activity that he's doing is criminal or non-criminal because of the penal sanctions attached to doing a criminal act. Yeah, but there's no argument that, that this would apply to uh, sexual intercourse in a parking lot. Well, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter about sexual intercourse. All that matters is the communication. Like, it, the act of prostitution is still yeah. right, yeah. but it's talking about it, that which is uh, illegal. What the devil happens now? Does that mean there are 190-odd cases or something? Yes. Will they now all be held up until you or the Crown appeals this Libby decision? Um, I've heard various um, public reports from the Crown, and I don't believe they're going to take, they're going to do that. I think they're going to continue on. Because As a matter of fact, I forgot the Attorney General told me this morning that they're going to continue the normal yes. enforcement. Yes. Although the police now say that they may change or they are going to change the way that they gather up evidence. Is this a clear example of a sloppy drafting of a bill in Ottawa? I think, I think that's exactly accurate and that's exactly right. Uh, if, you, if you look at one of the examples, it says every person who stops or attempts to stop any motor vehicle for the purpose of uh, obtaining the services of a prostitute. Now, who does that mean? Does that mean the person who's driving the car? What if there's a cabbie driving the car? Is it the cabbie or is it the person in the back that says, stop here, I'm going to go get a prostitute? Or is it the prostitute who waves? We don't know that. Or is it, uh, you've heard the expression that uh, her dress was so short that it would stop traffic? Yeah. Well, is, does that encompass that? We don't know. There's no standard. I could have written a damn thing better myself. So could you. Well, I wish they, they'd call me. <laughs> this is quite incredible. I'm uh, going to talk more. I'm going to take calls about this prostitution thing to Tony Serka. The famous Debbie Hutt case. That was the one which you won, which put everything in the air, didn't it? That was the one 
that caused the police to uh, talk to uh, journalists and uh, newspaper men and various media persons and when they perpetrated the big lie about the Deborah Hutt case. The Deborah Hutt case didn't go as far as the media and the police. I thought the Deborah Hunt case meant that you had to be to pressing and persistent. Pressing and persistent and collar them and take them up the back alley, perform the act, mm -hmm. and only then could they convict. That's, that's exactly not true. If uh, Anybody who reads the Deborah Hutt case will see that what happened was the police officer was at Helmican and Granville, stopped his car, smiled at Debbie, yeah. she smiled back, uh, he motioned for her to get in the car, she got in the car, and then they talked about sex. And that was it. No hammer lock, no headlock, nothing. It was the pressing and persistent. Though. Yeah, it was, it was the pressing and persistent was missing from that. So from that case, they said, "Oh, we have to uh, have a, put a half Nelson on on the." Uh, You're saying, the in other words, the police could have carried out the yes. old law perfectly well. Well, look what they did to the West End, uh, because of lack of enforcement of the laws. Uh, the, the people in the West End, rightfully were upset because their uh, neighborhood was law lawless. And then we had this incredible common law injunction. Yes. Let's not talk about that. Why not? Because I'm still on that case. Are you going to appeal it? Was no, it, it was appealed. And because they, they withdrew the injunction, you know, there's no more injunction left. So there's nothing left to appeal, the interim injunction. But the trial of the matter is still going ahead until they can discontinue or whatever. After the break. You've been up all bloody night, haven't you? It's Serka. Great name, that. Thank you. It's, Easily remembered. It's Sherka, but it's, it's Serka, but Where's it from? It, Yugoslavia, Dalmatian Islands, you know. Last week, John Fryer of the National Union of Provincial Government Employees was in this studio of free man. Today he was in a bucket in Newfoundland, charged with a violation of the criminal code. It seems that the illegal strike of the Newfoundland public service people is blowing up. Did you go to Newfoundland deliberately to be arrested, John Fryer, speaking to me from Newfoundland now? I certainly, um, I certainly uh, did not, Jack. I went to show support uh, for a bunch of workers that are striking for wage parity. Were you defying a court order this morning? Yes, um, the strike that is going on now involves about 2,000 highways workers and it's been deemed to be uh, um, an illegal strike by the Supreme Court of Newfoundland and, and uh, I went to visit the uh, picket line together with some other people this morning and, um, and uh, oh, about 40 or, or 50 uniform police arrived and uh, arrested us. How many of you were arrested? 47. And how long were you in the bucket? Oh, about three or four hours. Did you, get, did you have money to raise bail? Well, they, um, the uh, union down here arranged for a lawyer, and the lawyer came, and um, and uh, we're all, we're all now out on our own recognizance of uh, of a five hundred dollar bond. Are you going back to be rearrested now? Well, the um, uh, the um, the strike is um, heating up. Um, I was at a demonstration just about uh, an hour ago on the steps of the legislature here, where there was four or five thousand people from another bargaining unit uh, that has also been in a protracted set of negotiations. And I think there's every possibility to believe that, that could, it could escalate tomorrow morning. Is this the beginning of an Operation Solidarity or a general strike in Newfoundland? Um, it has, I think, some of the similarities uh, to that, uh, Jack. Um, the president of the Fishermen's Union, which is like the equivalent in Newfoundland of the IWA in BC in terms of the big private sector union, he was on the steps of the legislature pledging his membership support. The president of the Newfoundland and Labrador uh, Federation of Labor was on the line and arrested this morning, and he was there this afternoon pledging the entire labor movement support. Uh, I think there, are, there, there, is ever, there is a reason to believe that it could escalate into a general strike in this province. Okay, John, your friends and supporters and enemies in British Columbia will be either happy or glad that you've been in jail once today and may go to jail again tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, Thanks, yeah. John. John, that was John Fire of Nupchi. Now, back to Tony Serka, and... Uh, Who's <laughs> also out of custody. <laughs> You're oh. out of custody. Oh. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Hello? You go, yes. Hello, Tony? Yes. Hi, this is Michelle Canisciro. I just want Mr. Webster to be aware that under Bill C-49, there's been nothing but an increase of violence against prostitutes, which we now cannot report because police won't take our reports. In the downtown east side, there's been a 48% increase in violence. Women are being thrown 
out of cars, beaten, stabbed, and sexually raped, sexually assaulted. And this is because of Bill C-49, and the government is now just criminalized at least 1,400 women in this city. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold your breath for a minute. To be hold your breath for a minute. I don't accept what you say as there'd be some repercussions in the community. Can you confirm any of this, Tony? Well, yeah, I can confirm some of it. Um, uh, whenever you try to criminalize something that was not criminal before, you're going to get the people who are involved in that particular business to turn to an organization who will help them, and that, that, that's organized crime. The, uh, the, the need for pimps. Pimps w will love Section 195.1 because it means that the prostitutes need protection. Tony, there have always been pimps in the city of Vancouver. Yes, but... Uh, Operating in Gastown and elsewhere, did you well know? But with the former legislation, there was a lot less, a lot fewer uh, pimps. Uh, the former legislation, you mean the old legislation? Not VAG, the one after VAG C, the uh, Deborah Hutt uh, well, legislation. Well, that was fairly yeah. well, and the hookers used to look on the police as their protectors That's in many right. ways. That's you right. and I both know. Yes. And I remember the girl who was killed at the Georgia Hotel. The police would have stopped her before she had been thrown out the window by that American sailor. Mm -hmm. But she's trying to tell me that there's mayhem down there. Well, th this type of legislation will promote mayhem. I don't know if, it's, if, it, if it goes to the degree yeah. uh, that this young lady says, but uh, it certainly does promote that type of activity. Okay, my dear. Much obliged. Next call, please. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I may be a little dense, but I don't understand this totally, okay? If prostitution itself is legal, but having a place of business, like a house of business, advertising or talking to a potential customer is illegal, how can a prostitute, a legal prostitute, do business legally? It's almost impossible under this legislation. But you know that this legislation is not going to affect rich prostitutes. It's not going to affect pimps. It's not going to affect organized crime. It's going to affect the weak, and, you, and that's the people on the street. You know the object of the exercise, Mr. Serka, as well as I do. And the object of the exercise is to clear the apparent pest and problem from the streets. Excuse yes. Is that not correct? W yes, if, if it's a criminal nuisance, uh, Jack, but not just because people don't like looking at prostitutes. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that don't like looking at, at uh, various other people, but there shouldn't be laws that make those people criminal. Well, why isn't having a body house illegal then? I mean, wouldn't that be a solution to the crime? Well, that, that's, you know, you have to talk to your members of parliament about that. You know, why, why, uh, why do we have everything surrounding prostitution illegal, but prostitution itself legal? Shall I tell you why? Sure. Please. Because a body house under the criminal code is really living off the avails of prostitution, mm -hmm. which is a very serious offense well, what in if the, the criminal code. Well, the prostitute herself is living off the avails? Well, just a minute, we're not talking, we're talking about running a body house. A body house would in effect become a form of a brothel, and the politicians in Canada, right reason or none, do not have the guts to say, we are going to let individual hookers open their individual brothels. Am I right, Tony? You're exactly right. Why, we're right. taxpayers. No, no, that's, I'm uh, telling you why. I've lost my microphone. I'll say that again. Because the politicians are not prepared to make a decision that brothels be opened by removing the body house section of the criminal court. But they're prepared to make these people criminals, throw them in jail, I mean, yes. expose but, them to abuses. I mean, is, is that more right? That's one of the strange things about this is, is that, that most of my clients uh, who have been charged under this new section don't have criminal records. This is a new breed of hookers. That's right. Well, they're making them into instant criminals. Not like the old hookers who were very well organized in the West End. That's right. And had many elements of pimping involved. Well, that's well, the they thing that some. you've got to get away from. You don't charge the hookers, you charge the sleazy pimps. Very difficult to get evidence against pimps. It takes a lot of police work to get evidence against pimps. But if it were legal That's right. for a woman to open a body house, wouldn't that do away with some of the uh, undesirables? No, what all the prostitutes really want is to be able to uh, do their business without getting hassled, without being in danger. You notice that uh, before the injunction came down, they moved from the West End voluntarily. And then, uh, as a result of the injunction, they were supposed to move uh, past Granville. They moved past Granville. I thought it was comic opera, the whole business, with the police putting up the little traffic barriers in the, in to make sure. The Why whole can't thing... uh, hookers inhabit like a business section, which is not used by residents during the night hours? 
Well, I'll tell you why, because it's not socially acceptable in this country yet for a variety of reasons which the majority of people, I suspect, oppose. The majority of men that I have spoken to... The majority of women Well, the majority of women, I mean, especially depending on their financial status... Surely we're not in the business of encouraging the establishment of a whorehouse industry in Vancouver. No, uh, well, we're not in the business of encouraging um, uh, porn videos or anything like that. No, but but we we're allow it. You know, uh, go ahead, please. It's an endless. The fifties are over. Yes, I know. Yes. It's an endless discussion. I'm on. Go ahead, please. Okay. What my question is, is that what I don't understand is that they say, okay, prostitution is bad, and they're trying to get it off the streets and that, but yet they'll turn around and tell you that you can't do it at this end of the West End. You want to do it at this end on the other side of Granville. Or they advertise for you in the phone books under escort service. They they support the advertisements in the newspapers. They support the advertisements um, in the yellow pages, mm -hmm. except in the Vancouver Sun, the province. And yet they turn around and, and, and there's this big deal. They almost contradict themselves. Okay, Tony. And, and then they bore a hole through a hotel room and not even tell the owners they're going to do that so they can view what's happening inside the hotel room. Mm. In the meantime, however, we can't change the laws of the, all of the attitudes. Your next step, please. The next step is uh, I have another uh, case on Thursday involving uh, this, a similar type of offense, and it's before Judge Libby. So. And you will make the same argument? I don't know yet. My thanks to Tony Serka. Thanks very much Thank for coming, for Tony. Me. Maybe one day I'll go out of the 50s and into the 80s. Right. <laughs> and I'll be back after the break. Expo 86. 40. I rate my programs every day. I think that was about a B plus. Don't know what you thought. Anyway, tomorrow. Oh, Jim Hewitt, the education minister all freshly fueled and briefed to bring us right up to date on the latest uh, awards for excellence and crisis and textbooks with Webster tomorrow, live in the studio at 9 a.m. precisely. Expo 86, 45 days to go. Education Minister Jim Hewitt on the hot seat at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>